The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hi, everyone. Hello, uh, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Yeshua. I'm the Outreach and Social Media Coordinator for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. And on behalf of CCSN, I'd just like to thank you for attending today's webinar titled, uh, What Canadians Should Know About the Canadian National Breast Screening Studies. Uh, if you're new to one of our webinars, let me just take a moment to give you a brief overview of our organization. Uh, the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, or CCSN, is an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about the complexities of our health system, uh, connect with others to plan action, and then act. Uh, about um, act on those plans to promote better care and healthier survivorship. If uh, you'd like to learn more about CCSN, please visit our website at www.survivornet.ca. You'll find plenty of information there uh, on us, as well as news, events, and other resources that we think you'll, you'll find helpful. Uh, one final announcement before I hand things off to our presenter. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on YouTube. Uh, in addition, the slides will be available on SlideShare um, and links to both will be sent to uh, will be sent to the email that you provided in your registration. So you can share that resource uh, or go back and, and watch or, or review the slides again if you'd like. Um, now CCSN is pleased to welcome our presenter for today's webinar, uh, Dr. Daniel Copans the founder of the Breast Imaging Division of the Massachusetts General Hospital and a professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Copens is an internationally recognized expert in breast cancer detection and diagnosis. At the end of our presentation, we will have a short Q&A. Uh, however, don't feel the need to wait until the end. Please feel free to type your questions in uh, throughout. and. Um, and we'll have them queued up for Dr. Copans. So please welcome Dr. Daniel Copans. Yeshua, thank you very much uh, <clears throat> for the audience. Uh, Yeshua and I worked on this yesterday and he's gonna have to run the slides. So if there's a problem with the slideshow, uh, it's his fault, not mine. But there we go. Uh, as you know, uh, the topic is what Canadians should know about the Canadian National Breast Screening Studies. Next slide, please. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. The only disclosure I have is that I'm a consultant to DART Imaging, which is building digital breast homosynthesis devices for China. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to be fairly uh, blunt and candid, and I do this because lives are literally at stake. The poor results from the Canadian National Breast Screening Studies, which showed no benefit essentially uh, from screening, uh, have for decades been used to try and deny women access, actually denying women access to screening. Uh, in Canada, my understanding is that you don't encourage women in their 40s, although if they request it, I guess they can get mammograms. Um, the problem is, as I'll show you, uh, the trials are hopelessly compromised and should not be used to uh, make recommendations. Next slide, please. In general, there's been a huge amount of misinformation that's gotten past poor review in our, many of our respected medical journals. And then unfortunately, because the topics are somewhat complicated, the media have often just passed on the misinformation to the public. I think we all agree that women should be provided with accurate science and evidence-based information and should have the opportunity to participate in annual screening at least between ages 40 to 74. Thank you. Uh, I do want to make a point, and I, I suspect, I expect, that there are many survivors in on this uh, webinar, and some of you, unfortunately, may have had your cancers not detected by mammography early. Um, I apologize for that, but we've known forever that mammography is not the ultimate answer uh, to breast cancer. Uh, it doesn't find all cancers and doesn't find all cancers at a time when cure is possible. But while we wait for cures, and th th there are no absolute cures even on the horizon, finding cancers earlier has been proven to save numerous lives. Next, please. 
So these are data from uh, the um, U.S. Uh, I can't point, unfortunately, but uh, the blue arrow where it says death rate unchanged since at least 1940, that means that deaths from breast cancer as a percent of the population were a flat line in the U.S., I suspect the same in Canada, going way back. And you can see as we get into the 1970s and early 1980s, no change in deaths. And then soon after screening began in the U.S. and, and it began in the mid-1980s here, uh, the death rate began to fall, and it's declined continuously now uh, since uh, 1990. Uh, just as a correlation, the death rate for men with breast cancer, and we don't get breast cancer very frequently, but we do, and our death rate hasn't changed at all since uh, 1990. It's uh, still um, staying at the same rate that it was back then. And the only difference is men are, men are treated with the same therapies, uh, but we're not screened. And so that's a, one piece of information to support the fact that screening is making a difference. Next slide, please. So how do we know that screening saves lives? And I'm going to go into this in a little more detail. Randomized control trials, which are the most rigorous scientific studies, and I think you've all heard about them with the COVID vaccines, where they do random, did randomized control trials to uh, prove that the vaccines were safe and efficacious. Randomized control trials of breast cancer screening have proven that early detection saves lives for women ages 40 to 74. 50 has nothing to do with anything. There are, and I'll re reiterate this, there are no data that support um, the use of age 50 as a threshold for screening. None of the parameters of uh, screening change abruptly at the age of 50. The 40 to 74 are the ages of women who participated in the trials, and we have proof for saving their lives. Next, please. So here are the data. Uh, again, I apologize, I can't point, uh, but the, the lines each have a dot at each end with a dot in the center. The dot in the center is what's called the point estimate. In other words, at some time, uh, whatever year or date it is, you look at the data, and those are the data that are used on this particular graph. When the point estimates, that central dot on each line, are to the left of one, if you go down to the bottom of the graph, you see one with the vertical line, that means that there's a benefit. And if the whole line, all three dots, are to the left of one, that means statistically significant benefit. And you can see uh, that uh, there is a statistically significant benefit for screening women ages 40 to 74. Uh, next slide, please. Note that the Canadian data, the, they were called the NBSS initially, now they're called the CNBSS, are major outliers. Uh, they show no benefit for screening women. NBSS1 was women 40 to 49, and uh, NBSS2 was women 50 to 59. All the other trials show a benefit. The Canadian trials show no benefit. Next, please. Now, here are data for just women ages 40 to 49. Same idea, the point estimate, I didn't put the dots on either end of the line, but the point estimate is the central dot. And when the whole line is to the left of one, then that's a statistically significant benefit. And you can see they're screening women in their 40s, not looking at uh, women older than that. There is statistically significant decrease in deaths for women who participated in screening. Next, please. Next slide, please. Now, there are numerous observational studies. I'm not going to go into all of them, but many, many observational studies, which aren't randomized controlled trials. They look at what happens when you screen women in the population. And I'll just show you one from Canada. Next, please. And here you can see the red line on the right is that one. And you have major statistically significant differences in survival for women who participated in screening compared to those who did not. And this is also includes women in their 40s. So you have data from Canada that support the randomized control trials and show a major benefit for screening women ages 40 on up. Next, please. So given the science and evidence that supports screening women 40 to 74, 
It's unclear why Canada only urges women ages 50 and over to participate. Next, please. In fact, as I said earlier, there are no, I don't know how to say this any more strongly, as my teacher in high school said, zip, zilch, zero. There are no scientifically derived data that don't group an average uh, that support the use of the age of, 50, age of 50 as a threshold for screening. None of the parameters of screening, including lives saved, changed abrupt, change abruptly at the age of 50. So the fact that your um, uh, guidelines uh, group is saying wait until 50 and get screened every year, they have no scientific basis for that. I get screened every two years, excuse me. Screening every year, I should point out, um, has never been tested in a randomized controlled trial against screening every two years, but all of the scientific data, not surprisingly, suggests the more frequently you screen, the more lives you save. And the, our National Cancer Institute CISNET modeling group uh, all agree you save the most lives by annual screening starting at the age of 40. So the problem is that the CNBSS data have been used to argue in favor of delaying screening until age 50. And what many people don't know, and what I'm going to point out to you today, is the trials were compromised by an unblinded allocation process and recruitment of women who could not benefit from screening and the use of poor quality mammography. Uh, I'll just uh, relate a story from 1985. I was uh, in, the, in Russia uh, invited by Anthony Miller. Anthony Miller is the principal investigator in the Canadian study. And we were there talking about screening to the Russians. And um, I asked Tony why he included women who had clinically evident breast cancers. In other words, you could feel their breast cancers. They can't benefit from screening. Why would you include them in a screening trial? And he said to me at the time that uh, he needed all the women with breast cancer that he could get because that determines the power of the trial, and I'll explain that in a minute. And I naively, in 1985, I was still fairly young, uh, thought, oh, I guess that makes sense, until I realized that you could increase the power of your trial by having more women with breast cancer if you included women who had already died from breast cancer who couldn't possibly benefit from screening. And so it really makes no sense to include women uh, who have clinically evident breast cancer. It only dilutes the trial. Anyhow, let's go on. Next slide, please. So the CNBSS, and you can look this up, were um, two actually supposedly randomized control trials. Uh, they involved uh, multiple screening centers in Canadian provinces, about 90,000 women, 40 to 59, participated. I put randomly assigned in quotes, as I'll show you in a minute. It was not random. Next, please. CNBSS1 looked at women 40 to 49. Everyone had a clinical examination, uh, and the screening women had a mammogram every year, starting with the first year. After the first year, the, the control women uh, had nothing. They just, if they found a lump, they would go to their doctors in the community. It was called usual care. CNBSS2 uh, had women getting mammograms and clinical breast exam every year in the screening group, and the control women got clinical breast exams done by highly trained uh, nurses uh, every year as well. So that wasn't uh, as pure a study. Unfortunately, inappropriately, these two trials have been put together in the 25-year follow-up of the CNBSS, which uh, has confused the data. I think it was unfortunately done intentionally, so we couldn't tease out a lot of the data from 40 to 49, as I'll show you why that's important. Next slide, please. So uh, let's skip this one. I just talked about that. Next slide. So the pro fundamental problems in the CNBSS were, number one, and I'll come back to this later, the mammography was terrible. Uh, it's unclear why you do a trial of mammography screening and not try and have excellent mammography, but they didn't. They used obsolete mammography, as I'll show you. Uh, and then they had an unblinded allocation process, which imbalanced the two sides. So you start off with more women who are going to die in the screening arm than the control arm before you do anything. And women with clinically evident cancers, as I mentioned earlier, who can't possibly benefit from screening were recruited and allocated, as I'll show you, out of random order to the screening arms, corrupting the results. Next, please. <clears throat> so there have been concerns for decades. Just so you know what my background is, 
not only uh, have I known the principal investigators for 35 plus years, but I was invited by them with two other radiologists to review the quality of their mammograms because multiple advisors to the CNBSS had resigned because they were concerned about the poor quality of mammography. And we showed in their review, in other words, I was invited by them to review their mammograms. I'll show you later they published the review that the mammograms were poor to unacceptable through much of the trial. And in fact, no radiologist to my knowledge who participated in the trials has come out in defense of the quality of the mammography. Next, please. So let me just talk in general about uh, randomized controlled trials. They have to be designed properly and they have to be executed very carefully, otherwise they're not believable. Next, please. So randomization must be blinded. This means you can't know anything about the participants that could be used to assign, let's say, women with bigger cancers to one arm versus the other. You can't have those data. Otherwise, you could unintentionally, and I think that's what happened in the Canadian studies, but it, or intentionally imbalance the allocation. Next, please. So here's the fundamentals of a randomized control trial. The top of the screen is the general population that you're targeting. And every woman in red is someone who's going to develop breast cancer. We don't know who they are. Um, someone who's going to develop breast cancer during the trial. And the goal is to randomly assign them to two groups, one on the left, one on the right. Next slide. So that they will be equal groups. In other words, everyone in group A will essentially have a twin in group B, such that there will be the same number of breast cancers detected. And next slide, please. And the women in black are unfortunately women who die from breast cancer. If you just randomly assigned women to two groups, the same number of women would die from breast cancer during the trial. So that's the way randomization is supposed to work. Next, please. <clears throat> if, no, I'm sorry, go back one slide. If uh, the randomization is successful, and if screening on the left saves lives, then you'll have fewer deaths in the screen group than the control group. And because they're identical, the only difference between the two groups is one was screened and the other wasn't, then you'll have proof that screening saved lives if the difference is statistically significant. Next slide, please. And just quickly, statistical significance is a mathematical uh, analysis, but just in general, if I said to you, okay, we had seven women who died in the screen group and 10 in the control group, you'd say, well, seven versus 10, those aren't very big differences. I can flip a coin and have it come up heads five times in a row, but if I keep flipping it, it'll come up an even number of heads and even number of tails. So you'd say that doesn't sound significant. However, if I told you there were 70 deaths in the screening group and 100 in the control group, same ratio, seven versus 10, you'd say, hmm, 70 versus 100, that sounds significant. And that's what statistical significance is. It's a measure of whether something is likely to be due to chance or likely real. Next, please. So again, blinding is absolutely critical so you don't imbalance the study. If allocation is not blinded, then the trial can be compromised. Next, please. So here's uh, an unblinded, if you will, allocation. On the left, women with uh, palpable cancers, for example, were placed in greater numbers in the screening arm than the control arm. Next slide, please. So you end up with more cancers in the screening arm than the control arm. And next slide, please. More deaths in the screening arm versus the control arm. And this is exactly what happened in uh, CNBSS1, the, the trial of women 40 to 49. For many years, they had more cancer deaths in the screen group than the control group. And that was really a major concern, uh, which they put out misinformation based on those results, which I'll get to in a minute. Next, please. So again, RCT, randomized control trials, require a blinded process. You can't know anything about the women before you assign them, and the assignment has to be random. Uh, you can't put them on access to one list or the other. And both of these requirements were violated by the CNBSS. Next, please. 
In fact, they performed a clinical breast exam on every woman before she was assigned to one group or the other. So they knew ahead of time which women actually had masses in their breasts and, in fact, masses in their armpits, which represented enlarged lymph nodes with tumor. So they knew the women who had clinically evident cancers, and they allowed those women to be in the study. And what was even worse was that instead of just nowadays, you call a central um, uh, organization and you get a random number, and that's the assignment for that women. So the coordinators would have had no control over what group the women got assigned to. In the CNBSS, they had open lists, and they could assign women to whichever group they wanted. And this was uh, verified, you can see down at the bottom of the slide, a reference by Baylor and McMahon, who were commissioned by Canada to review the trial, and they agreed that this had happened. They said they didn't have evidence that it made a difference because they were ignoring the evidence. And as I'll show you, they also failed to interview the people who were doing the randomization. The coordinators who could assign women to whichever group they wanted, which is a major violation, uh, were never interviewed with protection from retribution. The uh, principal investigators in the Canadian trial would not allow them to be interviewed. So uh, these folks who have the answers to whether or not they assigned women out of order uh, have never been interviewed by uh, any objective group. And it was statistically significant excess of advanced cancers women assigned to screening. I'll show you about that in a sec. Next slide, please. So this is CNBSS1, the women 40 to 49. And they reported in their early uh, reports on the cancers of women who had four or more cancer-involved lymph nodes in their armpits who were assigned to the mammography arm, but only five were assigned to the usual care. This is at the beginning of the trial. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, no, go back, please. Thanks. Uh, the CNBSS explained well when, when this was brought to their attention, and I and others brought it to their attention. Uh, well, mammography finds more of everything. Well, that's just not true. Their data, their published data, show that 17 of the 19 that were assigned to the screening arm were found on the clinical breast exam. So it wasn't mammography that found them, they were on the clinical breast exam. Allocation of advanced palpable cancers was imbalanced. Uh, and in fact, Tyrone at the US National Cancer Institute showed that this was a statistically significant imbalance, unlikely due to chance. Next slide, please. So they assigned more women with basically incurable breast cancer to the screening arm than the control arm at the very beginning. And not surprisingly, in the first seven years, which they published, there were more deaths among screened women than among the unscreened women. That's never happened uh, in, in other trials. And remarkably, the survival rate in Canada in the 1980s was, the five-year survival was 75%. In the Canadian National Breast Screening Study, uh, one, for women 40 to 49, the survival in the control arm, these are women who weren't getting any screening, uh, was over 90%. We haven't achieved 90% in our countries until recently. So how are these women <laughs> surviving so well? They were just getting usual care. They were theoretically no different from the general population, yet they had incredible survival. Well, it was almost certainly because the women who were destined to die in the early years were assigned to the screening arm out of random order. Next, please. Another problem that is very difficult to get any handle on is that there are women in the control arm of the CNBSS, these were women who supposedly weren't getting mammograms, who got mammograms outside of the trial. Now, for various reasons, they're still counted as unscreened controls, but some of them may have had their lives saved by those mammograms. Next, please. The investigators argued that uh, these were just diagnostic studies. These were women who had some concern clinically, and so they got a diagnostic mammogram. Well, because the investigators weren't radiologists who did breast imaging, they had no idea that a diagnostic mammogram begins with standard screening views. Uh, so there were women in the control arm 
who may have had their lives saved by these screening mammograms, but no one's ever reported uh, on this in the CNBSS, so we have no data. Next, please. In the seven-year report, again, they noted uh, that there were more deaths in the screening arm, and they also noted that there was an excess of women with uh, cancer involving the lymph nodes in their underarms, so-called axillary adenopathy, uh, in the screening arm. Again, this is completely opposite to what's been in any other trial. Next, please. So lymph node positive cancers are real cancers, first of all, so you can't claim that these were fake cancers. Uh, they're not overdiagnosed cancers because having cancer in your lymph nodes suggests the cancer has figured out how to get out of the breast and go to other parts of the body. And again, every other screening study has shown that the screening arms have fewer women with positive nodes. Uh, if women were randomly assigned, then the number of women with positive lymph nodes uh, would have been the same in both groups, at least the same. Next, please. And here are their data where uh, they published in uh, 1993 that there were 102 women with positive nodes in the mammography arm, only 66 in the control arm. Uh, and there were more deaths in the mammography arm, not surprisingly, because there were more women with advanced cancers. Next, please. So again, as I mentioned earlier, the survival was 75% in Canada, five-year survival at the time of the CNBS, uh, and yet the women in the uh, usual care arm who were getting standard care in Canada, it was 90%. It makes no sense. Next, please. So instead of accepting the documented an obvious fact that their unblinded allocation on open lists resulted in placing more women who had bad breast cancer and were destined to die in the screening arm, they came up with crazy arguments. Next, please. They said mammography was squeezing cancer cells into the blood. That's pure nonsense. You can't squeeze cancer cells into blood vessels. And when you squeeze the breast, you actually squeeze down the blood vessels. So nothing can get into them. That's That was withdrawn by the investigators, but they stated it publicly and it <clears throat> made front page headlines. Radiation and the ataxia telangiectasia gene were operating. This I still don't understand. Uh, this was also nonsense, also withdrawn by the investigators. This, these were their explanations as to why they had more cancer deaths in their screening arm than their control. Instead of the obvious reason was they put more women destined to die, probably inadvertently, but they nonetheless in the screening arm. And then they had the argument that you remove the primary and that causes the metastatic lesions to kill the patient earlier. This came from uh, uh, some mouse studies. There are certain strains of mice that if you implant a cancer in them uh, and then you remove that cancer, if they have metastatic lesions, those lesions grow faster. What the uh, CNBSS failed to, to tell people was that this faster growth was only for a few hours and the mice didn't die any faster. So it was a nonsense argument, but again, it was put out in the press and scared a lot of women. Next, please. So uh, this was, a lot of it was made in the media about the CNBSS having younger women dying faster because of screening than in the control group. Uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Baines uh, offered these nonsense physiologic arguments and then later on withdrew them. Next, please. So here, if you want to look it up, this is from the Journal of the National Cancer Institute in 1992, where they're reporting that Dr. Miller and Dr. Baines retracted their warnings. This is after they'd all appeared in the media and frightened, I think, a lot of women. Next, please. And this is just that article. You're welcome to go through it. Next, please. Just again, quoting, uh, at the time, the data indicated a 52% increase in breast cancer deaths in the group of women ages 40 to 49 who were screened. Well, you can imagine how frightening this was for women who were being told to participate in screening. Next, please. Uh, again, front page in the London Sunday Times. Uh, 
breast cans boost risk of cancer death. Next, please. And here are, you know, where they said that cancer cells were being squeezed into the blood or the ataxia telangiectasia gene was somehow operate, operating. This is a very rare gene and uh, its significance is still debatable. Uh, next, please. And yet the stories continued to circulate. Next, please. And again, Dr. Miller, instead of saying we messed up, because that would be very hard to admit, because his trial would be useless, uh, they came up with these strange arguments for uh, why there were so many more deaths in the screening arm, and he claimed it was a freak statistical vagary uh, rather than a randomization error. It was clearly a randomization error, but they've never admitted that. Next, please. So although they ultimately retracted the false claims, this contributed to the scientifically unsupportable claim that women ages 40 to 49 are affected differently by screening. Next, please, they're not. They ignored the fact that the cancer's deaths among the screen women were likely due to the sides being loaded against screening by putting more women, probably again, not intentionally, but I suspect the coordinators weren't well informed about randomized control trials. And they thought, well, we want to make sure these women who have, look like they have cancer get a mammogram. So they put them in the screening arm out of a random order. I don't think it was done intentionally, but the results are the same. You corrupt the trial. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Again, contamination is when women who are supposedly unscreened controls have mammograms. Next, please. And again, just to uh, reinforce this, uh, there were 26.4% of the usual care group who were theoretically not getting mammograms had mammograms. And again, we don't know whether that saved lives in the control arm, which would also have made screening uh, look not as good because you'd be saving lives in the control women uh, based on their getting screening mammograms. Next, please. I apologize. I know this gets confusing, but this these, these are the facts and you need to understand them. So again, every diagnostic exam examination begins with a screening study so that the women who are getting the mammograms in the control arm were being screened at the same time. And we don't know how many of those women had their lives saved by screening. The problem with a lot of this, especially with the quality of the mammograms, is that all of the groups that have reviewed the trials don't include experts in uh, breast cancer screening. They're all epidemiologists or public health people or whatever, so they don't know the importance of these factors. They think a mammograms a mammogram. Next, please. So it should be easy enough to find it how many cancers were detected in the usual care group, but no one's ever tried to do that. Next, please. So the reduced deaths in the control arm, remember they had a 95% five years, almost, I mean, over 90% five-year survival, uh, may well be due to the fact not only that there were women who were destined to die uh, in the screening arm allocated to screening, but they may have saved lives by getting mammograms outside the trial and weren't counted as screened. Next, please. So let me talk about the poor quality of the mammography. Again, this has been ignored because the people who review the trials don't read mammograms. So they think, oh, a mammogram is a mammogram. You know, what's this quality stuff? Well, you would think that a major trial costing, I think it was 16 million 1985 Canadian dollars to evaluate a technology-dependent test would involve modern, state-of-the-art technology. But that wasn't the case in the CNBSS. Next, please. And in fact, Martin Yaffe, who was the reference physicist on the Canadian studies, has admitted that uh, the quality in the NBSS was far below state-of-the-art, even for that time, in the early 1980s. So their own physicist has uh, pointed out that the mammograms were terrible. Next, please. And this, these are slides from uh, Dr. Yaffe. Uh, the kind of mammography in the CNBSS on the left 
and uh, the uh, 2004 mammogram on the right. That quality on the right could have also, uh, I'll show you in a second, been achieved almost, not quite as good, but almost as good in the 1980s. The Swedish two-county trial was producing spectacularly good mammography, equal to what you see on the right, and yet um, even when Dr. Tubar, who oversaw the Swedish trial, came to advise Canada, uh, they didn't listen to him. Next, please. So just a short summary. The trial used old mammography machines. I'm told one in Vancouver was 10 years old. It was at least one secondhand unit. They didn't use grids. I'm going to show you about that in a second. The technologists and radiologists weren't trained to perform or do or read the mammograms. They were just, or they had a one day or a few day course. And they used the medial lateral view versus the medial lateral oblique. I'll show you about that in a second. Next. And in, in fact, Professor Miller admitted that the radiologists were not experienced. They were busy people being asked to read large numbers of films. None of them were prepared to make mammography their only occupation. Again, this is a major trial of screening and you've got inexperienced people. And then they didn't use grids because they were under pressure to not have high exposure values. And it turns out for women 40 and over, there's literally no provable risk from radiation, and even the extrapolated risk is incredibly low, if at all. Um, but they didn't use grids. Next, please, for much of the study. <clears throat> Regardless, uh, using uh, not using grids to reduce scatter and um, using the straight lateral instead of the medial lateral oblique compromises image quality and detection of small cancers. Next, please. So here's a mammogram. This isn't from the NBSS, but the quality of the mammograms in the NBSS. Again, I reviewed them, so I can say that. And this is no grid. You can see the sort of a vague white area in the upper part of this breast. Next, please. This is the same patient, same day, same breast with a grid. And now you can see the obvious cancer with the lines coming out from it, the, the tentacles. This is why they're called cancers, because it looks like uh, the uh, zodiac sign for a crab, and that's a very big cancer. Next slide. That could have been missed on the non-grid mammogram on the left, but obvious on the right. And you can imagine if that was a small cancer, uh, it would almost certainly have been missed. So not using grids means you're going to miss cancer. Next slide, please. And they didn't use the medial lateral oblique projection which was described in 1976, so it was available to the CNBSS. Uh, and you can see at the bottom, those are medial lateral obliques of both breasts. And you can see all the way back to that triangular white area in the, the two in the center of the film are the uh, pectoralis major muscles, which show that you're getting much, much, if not most, of the breast into the field of view. By not using that view, you leave a lot of breast out. Next, please. In fact, um, over half of the cancers are located in the upper outer portion of the breast, which was not included on the mammograms used in the CNBSS. Next, please. So here's a poorly positioned, again, this isn't from Canada, but similar to the images that I reviewed, medial lateral mammogram interpreted as negative. Next slide, please. And now the arrow points to a little vague density that I can't prove this, but I think the person who read this mammogram thought that it was that that white line sort of going up toward there is a blood vessel, and they mistaked mis that that cancer, small cancer, was mistaken and misinterpreted as a blood vessel. Next slide, please. Here we are a year later. The cancer is now much larger and visible. The mammogram is a little better, still not great, but now you can see this cancer, and let's put the slides together. Next, please. So there's the previous cancer, the previous mammogram on the left, where a small, potentially curable cancer was missed, and now it's much larger and probably incurable on the right, at least a year later. Next. So the principal investigator, as I said, performed a study that I participated in. I was one of uh, three radiologists. Myron Moskowitz from Cincinnati was the other one, and Doug Sanders, Nathan Saunders, was a Canadian radiologist. We reviewed 
mammograms that were provided to us by the Canadian researchers. Next, please. And this is the paper that Dr. Baines and Dr. Miller published. You can see I'm on the paper. We actually showed that for much of the trial, the mammograms were poor to unacceptable. And yet they presented this as the glass is half full. They got better as the trial went on. But uh, all those cancers that were probably missed because of the poor quality of mammography. Next, please. So the poor quality has been ignored, as I said earlier, because the folks who review this trial aren't radiologists. They're not, we're not included in review committees because we're vested interests and we'll they're afraid we'll be biased in our analysis. So you don't have anyone who knows anything about mammography reviewing these trials, and the poor quality has been ignored. Next, please. So if, if I uh, told you there was a treatment trial where we're going to use an obsolete, outdated chemotherapy agent to treat women with breast cancer, and the women, that corresponds to poor quality mammography, the women with the largest cancers were known before we assigned women to the treatment arm or the control arm. Uh, and the participants, uh, the treatment um, trial got larger cancers because the assignment was done on open lists. So now you've got an imbalanced study. There was a statistically significant excess of women with large cancers assigned to the treatment arm. And there was no difference in survival in the two arms. And the investigators claimed there was no value to any chemotherapy, not just this obsolete poor quality one, but any because they showed no benefit. Next. That trial, that treatment trial, would be thrown out as corrupted, and an invest ethics investigation would have been launched. What's baffling to me is, why is this the correct analysis for a treatment trial, but it doesn't apply to mammography screening? Next. There's more evidence that random allocation was compromised. Next, please. In their 25-year follow-up, they reported that only 32% of the cancers were detected by mammography alone in the screening arm. Well, that reflects the poor quality of the mammography and also the fact that they loaded the sides with palpable cancer, well, they included palpable cancers and loaded the screening arm. So here are the data. It's hard to read on this slide, but you can go to the paper. This is the paper that should never have been published because they combined the two trials, so that obscures the information from each trial. But only 32% of the cancers in the screening arms were detected by mammography alone. Next slide, please. In a study in the United States 10 years earlier, 10 years before the CNBSS, 42% of the cancers were detected by mammography alone. So they were 10% worse in the CNBSS, and yet it was a trial done 10 years later. Next, please. And then they claimed, well, the CNBSS claimed that their clinical breast exam was so good that they found cancers as early as mammography. Well, if that's the case, why are we guiding surgeons to so many cancers that they can't feel? Uh, it's because mammography finds cancers that you can't feel. So that was just a nonsense argument. Next, please. A small percentage of mammographically detected cancers indicates the fact that many women with clinically evident cancers were recruited to the trial. As I told you, um, Professor Miller admitted that to me in 1985, despite the fact that they couldn't benefit and at best would dilute any benefit, but at worst, imbalance the trial. Next, please. So again, the data clearly show there was an excess of women with advanced cancers in the screening arm more deaths in the screening group, greater than 90% five-year survival, more women with involved lymph nodes in their underarms, larger cancers in the screening arm. Next, please. These are all evidence that the trial was compromised. Next, please. And then they went on and claimed that mammography was finding cancers that would have disappeared if they hadn't been found by screening or never become clinically relevant. Next, please. This is called overdiagnosis. Uh, is that the last slide you have? Shouldn't be. Next, please. Next, please. No, I'm sorry. Let's, let's go back to that one. So in, in their own data, 
they, they claim that there were 22% excess of cancers in the screening arm. In fact, their own data show that it was less than 4%, if at all. Next, please. And that's this slide. Next, please. And just uh, uh, one more uh, point. Uh, next, please. The uh, Dr. Baines has claimed that screening led to massive overdiagnosis, but the data that she provides show that 40% of the excess cancers, if there were excess cancers, were found after screening stopped. So this again suggests that there was a fundamental imbalance in how the women were allocated. Next, please. So despite claims there's never been an objective review of the CNBSS. Next, please. As I mentioned, Baylor uh, um, and McMahon uh, published a review of their allocation. Next, please. Uh, they never, next, please, never interviewed the uh, women who did the allocating, but uh, clearly admitted that randomization occurred after the clinical exam and that the um, information was provided to the coordinators. Next, please. Uh, next, please. I'm going to go quickly because we're running out of time. This is from a letter that I sent to Dr. McMahon in 1995, urging that they needed to interview the coordinators to find out if non-random allocation actually took place. Uh, they didn't do this. So the people who actually know whether non-random allocation took place innocently, I'm not saying they did it on purpose, uh, have never been interviewed, and unfortunately many of them have died, uh, so we may never know. Next, please. Um, the CNBSS was supposedly cleared. Next, please. But they only looked at three centers and looked for erasures to see if they had, they didn't have to erase, all they had to do was skip a line. Next, please. Coordinators were never interviewed. Next. Uh, let's skip this. Next, please. <clears throat> if allocation was compromised, longer follow-up doesn't make it better. Uh, the allocation of the trial arms must be blinded. That's just absolutely required for any randomized. These aren't my rules. These are the rules for randomized control trials. Next, please. We weren't blinded in the NBSS. Um, they didn't really test mammography screening because they had such poor quality of mammography. They violated the fundamental rules of randomized controlled trials by providing a clinical breast exam first and then assigning women on open lists so that they could be assigned out of random order. And the data strongly suggests that. Next, please. The CNBSS are compromised trials. The results are unreliable and they should not be used to guide screening recommendations. Next, please. The scientific evidence proves that screening saves lives for women ages 40 to 74, and women should be offered uh, screening for those women, and I would argue annually because all of the scientific data points to the fact that the more frequently you screen, the more lives you can save. Well, I've gone over a little bit. I hope there have been some questions, and uh, I'm happy to take any and all questions. And if um, we don't have time, I'm happy to have you email me uh, the questions at dcopans at verizon.net, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Yeshua, can we take some questions? Yeah, I, um, we've got some questions here that came in through the chat. Um, I'm going to read this one. It seems fairly specific, but um, you'll be able to, to let us know. Uh, the first one says, I'd like to know what is the best screening for a cancer recurrence. My situation is that my breast cancer was detected when I was 48 years old, and unfortunately, um, by my self-breast examination, um, it was missed on the mammogram the month before. Thus, I would like to know what the optimal screening for patients to catch it if it comes back. Well, I'm not sure there are good good data on that. I would still try a mammogram. I know you're not happy with mammograms. And I don't blame you at all. But <clears throat> sometimes recurrences will show up when the primary didn't. Um, you know, again, I would talk it over with your doctor. Uh, 
the best way to find breast cancer is magnetic resonance imaging, but it's expensive. You have to be injected with a contrast agent. Um, but, uh, and again, I don't know of any trials looking at recurrent uh, breast cancers, but I would talk to your doctor about maybe getting magnetic resonance imaging scans. Um, another one here says, was there a plan for patients who had a finding on CBE uh, at entry to the study, even if um, the clinical breast examination had been performed after the randomization? If not, what? I'm sorry. Was the clinical breast examination was performed before the uh, allocation. It could have been done after. Once you've assigned people, uh, then they would have been assigned actually in CNBSS1. They all would have gotten a clinical breast exam whether they were in the screen group or the control group. The difference is that if you know before the randomization, you have the opportunity to compromise random allocation. And because the women were then assigned on open lists, it was possible to compromise the allocation and the data strongly suggest that that happened. And there will be some information coming out in the future that reinforce that. Um, this one asks, what are your thoughts about using ultrasound in addition to a mammogram on an annual basis? Yeah, ultrasound will detect uh, cancers that are not evident on mammography. And um, uh, Paula Gold in Canada is probably one of the world's leading experts on this. and. Uh, uh, she can talk to it at greater length than I can. But um, the problem is we don't know whether that saves lives. I personally think it probably does, uh, but uh, there's never been a randomized controlled trial to prove that. One was attempted back a number of years ago, but our National Cancer Institute, which unfortunately does not support screening women in their 40s, uh, wouldn't let it be a big enough trial to look at mortality. Uh, but I think if you have dense breasts uh, and you can get ultrasound screening, I certainly wouldn't have object to that. Mm. Uh, dense breasts, by the way, just so you know, dense breasts, uh, there's a range of uh, what we call density on a mammogram. When you look at a mammogram, the white areas are uh, the glandular tissue that during nursing manufactured milk, and they're supported by fibrous connective tissue that holds everything together. And that those tissues look the same on mammograms in terms of their whiteness. Uh, and so they can hide. It's like trying to see a, a birch tree in a pine forest. Uh, if it's surrounded by a lot of pines, you can't see the birch tree even though it's got white bark. Uh, so women with dense breasts have a lot of fibrous connective tissue and glandular tissue and cancers can be hidden. So in those women, we still find cancers, and we still find cancers early enough to save lives, but the sensitivity, the ability to do that is reduced in dense breasts. So women should certainly be examining themselves periodically, I would say once a month, uh, if you're still premenopausal after your period's over. And if something new happens, you should bring it to your doctor's attention, even if you've had a recent uh, mammogram. Ultrasound can help find cancers in women with dense breasts. But also point out, in Again, this is a technology that I developed, so I'm a little biased, but digital breast tomosynthesis will find some of those cancers in dense breasts that we don't see on 2D mammography. So if you have the opportunity to be screened using DBT, I would urge you be screened using DBT. All women should be. Okay. Um, you may have just answered this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, I'm curious what other, uh, what other screening methods are useful for diagnostics other than or in conjunction with mammography? Uh, you mentioned MRIs and just now uh, DDT. Well, so it's very important to distinguish screening methods versus diagnostic methods. Mm -hmm. So ultrasound is an incredibly valuable diagnostic method. So we see something on a mammogram, <clears throat> the patient comes back in, we look with ultrasound and it's got fluid in it, which you can't tell on a mammogram. And the ultrasound tells you that's a simple, benign, not cancerous cyst. So that's a terrific benefit right there. We don't have to worry about what we saw on the mammogram. Uh, screening right now, the only proven method for saving lives, because it's the only test that's had randomized controlled trial 
perform, trials performed as I explained them is mammography screening. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't save lives by finding breast. I mean, I would argue that the randomized control trials prove that earlier detection saves lives. And any way you can detect breast cancer earlier gives you the potential to save lives. So again, major groups aren't necessarily advocating it, but additional screening of women with dense breasts with ultrasound may be helpful. I personally think magnetic resonance imaging could greatly reduce the death rate. MRI finds many more cancers that we find even with mammography and ultrasound at a time when they can be cured. And it's unfortunate, actually years ago, I argued for an MRI randomized control trial back in 2000, and instead the money was made wasted on a study called DMIST, which was unnecessary and useless. <clears throat> and we would know by now that screening with MR, I believe, with MR would save even more lives than we're saving. But for now, mammography screening is the proven test. Anything else you do to try and figure out what something is, either that you found on a mammogra mammographic screening study or a clinical exam or a patient feeling something, those are diagnostic studies and they're, uh, almost anything goes to figure out what something is. But now we have uh, very accurate ways of if you can feel something or see it on a study, you can put a needle into it. I know that sounds grotesque, but <clears throat> it's interesting. The inside of the breast is relatively pain-free, and I'm sure there are some women who've had needle biopsies who are going to argue with me about that, so I'm not going to argue. But it's very safe, very accurate. So you can do a needle biopsy and find out what something is uh, very accurately. Um, two more. Um... And one being, uh, what are the risks of an MRI as it seems as if the cost is the biggest barrier following your webinar? Yeah, um, <clears throat> there aren't many risks from MRI except for the cost, and the cost is a pretty formidable risk, although people are working on ways to do screening <clears throat> at lower cost. So hopefully that's going to become uh, more available. Um, gadolinium is a material that's uh, injected intravenously, and that's why MR is so good, because cancers uh, do what's called enhance. The blood vessels that cancers develop show up really well on uh, MRI. And the other advantage of MR is you can see all the way back to the chest. Even a mammogram doesn't get the entire breast. So if we could screen with MR, we would, I'm sure, find more curable cancers. There's some concern that the contrast agent in some women accumulates in their brain, doesn't get completely removed from the body. I'm told, and I'm not an expert in this, that there are new contrast agents that don't do that. So we can figure out how to do MR uh, at a reasonable cost so that it can be offered. What we need to realize is that vast majority of women who develop breast cancer don't have increased risks. Women who have genetic predispositions, the so-called BRCA or BRCA1, BRCA2 genes, only account for about at most 10% of the cancers each year. And another maybe 15% are women who got a family history or um, a biopsy proven uh, increased risk lesion. They only account for another 15%. So about 75% of women who di are diagnosed with breast cancer each year have no de definable risks. And this is another piece of misinformation that's being pushed. Oh, let's just screen the high-risk women. Well, if you do that, you'll miss 75% of cancers. So what our uh, the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging, and I'm pretty sure the Canadian Society also agrees with this, that all women age 40 and over should be screened uh, using mammography, and I would add annually. And then high-risk women may benefit from additional screening, say, every six months, alternating with the mammography screening with something like magnetic resonance imaging, or some people could argue for ultrasound as being less expensive, not as good as MR, but better than just mammography alone. So be careful when your, your organizations say, oh, let's just screen the women who are going to get breast cancer. That would be wonderful if we knew who was going to get breast cancer and we could find them early. We don't, and we don't know who's not going to get breast cancer. So be very careful when people say, oh, let's just screen high-risk women. Um, and, and one last 
question that we have time for. Um, if uh, the this person asks, if the scientific evidence proves that screening saves lives for women ages seven, uh, 40 to 74, why have our um, distinct national organizations haven't why haven't they changed the recommendation to encourage average women uh, to to average risk women to get screened between the ages of 40 and 49? Well, uh, I can't say because I haven't been involved in the discussions, but they put a lot of weight on the CNBSS, which showed no benefit for screening women in their 40s. Um, and they've misinterpreted the data or data have been mispresented. There was a big study in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the journal of my uh, medical school, uh, highly respected journal, it's just nonsense, where they claim that screening women in their 40s resulted in 70,000 fake cancers in 2008 alone. It's just that if you read the paper, it's an embarrassment. It should never have been published. It was based on a guess. That's the word they use. We guess how many cancers there should have been. So anyhow, the point is, if you have review groups <clears throat> that don't really understand the data and how they were acquired, they're just looking at the numbers. Uh, people have played with the numbers and said, oh, you can wait until 50 and get screened every two years. There are no data that support that unless if you average data. So, for example, if we look at the cancer detection rate among women in their 40s and compare it to women in their 50s, women in their 40s have on average about two cancers per thousand women, whereas it goes up to about three cancers per thousand women. I'm sorry, one cancer per thousand in their 40s, two cancers per thousand in their 50s. So it looks like, well, it doubles at 50. Well, no, that's averaging and uh, over the whole group. If you looked at the cancers in women age 40, there's about one per thousand. At age 41, there's 1.1 per thousand. At age 42, there's 1.2 and so on. So by the time you get to 50, it's now up to two per thousand. But a 49-year-old woman is essentially no different from a 50 or 51-year-old woman. But if you average the data, then you can make it look like there's a, a major jump at 50, and you make it look like there's a major jump at 60 and at 70 and so on. And that's what's happened. People have grouped and averaged data instead of looking at it by annual age and realizing nothing happens at 50. <clears throat> and there's there's no proof that, um, uh, well, there's proof that screening women ages 40 to 49 saves lives, period. That's been proven in randomized controlled trials. There's no data to support waiting until age 50, except maybe saving money. And I suspect that delayed screening in Canada is primarily to save money. You have a national health program, as I understand it. And they're not going to say to women, well, we don't want to spend the money to save your lives. They say instead, well, we don't want to upset you because the callback rate's a little higher in your 40s. And there may be some uh, overdiagnosis, which there probably isn't, but they claim that. And the Canadian study showed there's no benefit. And so let's wait until 50 and, and get screened uh, instead of saying it's about the money. I, again, as there's so many things, I can't prove it, but I'm fairly certain it's about the money. Uh, but I know there are certainly experts in breast cancer screening in Canada who've been arguing for years uh, that we sh that you should start screening starting at the age of 40. They're supported by the data. We've maintained in the U.S. access to screening, annual screening starting at 40 because we've stuck with the data and argued and pointed out misinformation such as what's come out of the CNBSS. But we still have people who want to wait until 50 and screen every two years willing to let women die to save money. Wow. Well, um, I just want to thank Dr. Daniel Copans again for uh, sharing all this information, for taking some time also to answer our questions and uh, what an incredibly insightful um, talk and, and presentation. Um, this is one of uh, many webinars that we facilitated in 2021. Um, all of our previous webinars are available on uh, through our website on demand at survivornet.ca. Um, I believe, yeah, all of our information should be on the screen there. If you have any questions that weren't answered today, you can email info at survivornet.ca.
and uh, we will be sure to pass them on to Dr. Copans, um, and and he hopefully will um, be able to get back to some of them, or we'll be able to point you to some great resources as well at CCSN. Um, and I but, want to thank I want to thank you, Yeshua, for all your help and work today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for for saying that. Um, we have two, uh, one more webinar so far scheduled in October that is going to be taking place in two weeks. We'll have somebody from Inspire Health uh, out in BC joining us again and look forward to getting that information in your email. Um, one last thing before we let you go. I know we're a little over time, but um, if you're not seeing our emails come into your inbox, please check your spam as we use a third party uh, email service to to send out our blasts. So they might get filtered through your spam. So please check your spam filter. Um, so that way you can be getting all of our emails and uh, webinar updates. Again, thank you so much for attending. And thank you so much to Dr. Copans for uh, presenting this information. Thank you.